Good morning, everyone. This is a public hearing of the Committee on Public Safety regarding resolution number 210090. Before we start this hearing, I'd like to recognize Samantha Williams Esquire for an important uh, announcement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the daily news inquirer and legal intelligence are prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. Everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy and by continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to be recorded. Additionally, prior to Councilman Jones recognizing members for questions or comments they may have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. And um, at this time, I'd like to call the roll to establish a quorum. And will members uh, make brief remarks so that your image appears on the screen. Council member Thomas. Council member Green. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Ms. Williams. Pleasure to be here for this hearing um, on this important topic. Good morning. Council member Gautier. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Samantha. Uh, good morning, colleagues, and to the public present. Good morning, Council Member Gim. Good morning, Council, uh, to Mr. Chairman. Good morning, colleagues, and good morning to the public. Council Member Brooke. Good morning. Good morning, Vice Chairman Johnson. And Chairman Jones. Present and uh, good morning to all, uh, including the viewing audience. Mr. Um, Chairman, I'm sorry, this is Council Member Thomas. Um, I just want to be marked as present. I apologize to you and the clerk. Duly noted, sir. Not a problem. Um, before we, uh, a quorum has been established. This, meet, this committee hearing is called to order. Ms. Williams, will you please read the title of the resolution for today? Resolution number 210090, authorizing the City Council Committee on Public Safety to hold public hearings to examine more equitable solutions to crime scene cleanup policies that place the logistical and financial burden on the families of homicide victims. Thank you. And before I begin, I'd like to um, speak to this resolution. Um, during the pandemic, um, COVID attacks things in your body often that have pre-existing conditions and or are weakened. So whether you have a, a heart problem, organ problem, a high blood pressure problem, it goes right to it and exasperates that problem. COVID did that also for society. It attacks and exposed all kinds of things that before we did not recognize as clearly as we do now. One of those things was that <clears throat> gun shootings, homicides did not take a holiday during COVID, did not seek shelter during the pandemic, but was exasperated and we were able to slow down just enough <clears throat> to see some of the devastating impacts, unintended consequences that come with homicide. And one of them is crime scene cleanups on your worst day, on the, on the day you may have dreaded it and, and have a nightmare where uh, a parent may have to prematurely uh, deal with uh, funeral arrangements for a child that was taken away 
uh, due to senseless gun violence. On that day, they also are made aware that it is your responsibility to clean that crime scene. When I first uh, heard about it, I had to stop, say, excuse me, would you please repeat that again? And um, it was explained to me um, what that process was like, how many Philadelphians have to deal with that burden, uh, and then uh, how expensive cleaning up a crime scene can be, how traumatizing uh, emotionally it is, uh, and that there are resources available, but very few people know about it nor think about it during their time of such extreme duress. So what we wanna do is make sure that we know uh, what the processes are. We wanna know what the resources are that are available. And finally, if there's more we can do by way of support uh, uh, to the victims of um, gun violence, we wanna do that as well. So with that, are there any other members of the committee that would like to uh, make an opening statement? Hearing none, um, Ms. Williams, can you please call the first panel uh, to testify? The first panel of witnesses to testify will be Natasha Daniela De Lima McGlynn, Sam Margolis, and Stephanie LeClaire. Thank you all for your patience. Um, and please uh, state your name for the record uh, and begin your testimony in the order uh, that you were called. Good morning. Uh, my name is Natasha Daniela Delima McGlynn, and I'm the interim executive director of the Anti Violence Partnership of Philadelphia, or AVP. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share our expertise and work with the City Council's Committee on Public Safety in support of Resolution 210090, which is intended to examine more equitable solutions to crime scene cleanup policies and practices that currently place the logistical and financial burden on the families of homicide victims. As advocates for victims of crime, family members and friends of homicide victims, and communities impacted by homicide and violence, we very much appreciate the light you're shining on this critical issue. First, let me provide a brief overview of the scope of our work and expertise. ABP is a nonprofit 501c3 victim service agency that was founded nearly 40 years ago. We are one of six victim service agencies in Philadelphia. Our mission is to end the cycle of violence by providing a wide range of intervention, prevention, and support services to children, youth, and adults traumatized by exposure to violence to help them rebuild their lives in the aftermath of violence. Our dedicated staff of therapists, counselors, and victim advocates serve approximately 3,000 clients annually. In 2016, ADP was one of seven national organizations awarded a grant from the United States Department of Justice's offices, Office of Victims of Crime to enhance systemic responses to complex homicides. ABP conducted an extensive investigative study exploring the experiences and needs of survivors of intrafamilial homicide through, extent, through interviews with survivors. In addition to the profound trauma interviewees described, many reported the unexpected ordeal of having to clean up the crime scene. While this experience is not unique to intrafamilial acts of violence, this key finding exposed a glaring oversight in existing policies and practices that impact victims and survivors across Philadelphia. Specifically, current practices direct the Philadelphia Police Department and support personnel to travel to the crime scenes to gather evidence and conduct an investigation, but do not address the need for cleaning any biohazardous material left at the scene. Existing literature suggests that proper crime scene cleanup cannot be performed by an average citizen without certification and training. Additionally, there are a number of regulations on the local, state, and federal levels when it comes specifically to biohazard cleaning. Yet while these rules and regulations exist to protect us from health risks by exposure to dangerous chemicals, toxins, and diseases, when it comes to crime scenes, victims and survivors in their state of traumatic shock are typically left to clean up the crime scene themselves without any guidance or assistance from the city. Consequently, victims and survivors clean up the blood and bodily remains of their loved ones at great physical and psychological cost to themselves. 
There are currently no policies or practices across the city's administrative agencies that make crime scene cleanup services accessible and available to families and communities impacted by violence. Recognizing these notable deficiencies, ABP initiated a project to explore crime scene cleanups. Today, we release our findings in a report entitled Blood on Our Hands, Addressing Crime Scene Cleanup in the City of Philadelphia. The production of this report was made possible by subsequent development to, to our intrafamilial homicide grant. This report is the first venture of its kind by our agency. It exemplifies our initiative in seeking novel and pragmatic solutions to the problems our clients and the citizens of Philadelphia face as a result of incidents of violence. In identifying the circumstances faced by victims and survivors of homicide in particular, we note the disproportionate impact on Philadelphians who are Black and Latin. Of the 2,167 shootings in 2020, 84% of victims were Black and 9% were Latin. The same racial inequity is true for homicide co-victimization. 83% of homicides between 2016 and 2020 involved Black victims and 10% involved Latin victims. In the status quo, crime scene cleanup is part of a larger system that further marginalizes Black and Latin people in the aftermath of violence and homicide. This marginalization is unjust and emblematic of the systemic racism that communities of color continue to endure. Lastly, our report proposes changes to policies and practices at the city level in support of victims and survivors, ranging from the city assuming the log logistical and financial responsibility for the removal of biohazardous materials from crime scenes, to providing comprehensive resources to the public that educate and support survivors in the aftermath of homicide. These solutions are intended to be tangible, practical, and implementable. It goes without saying that the past year has been difficult for our city. Between the COVID-19 pandemic and a gun violence epidemic, we have been hurting in unprecedented ways. Yet the occurrence of this endemic has given us an opportunity to come together as a community and explore the disparities and the unnecessary hardships that prevent children families, and communities of color from accessing opportunities that create the path to a fulfilling life. Thank you to our clients for trusting us and for courageously being here with us today to share their experiences. This is not an easy matter to discuss. In fact, several clients declined, several clients declined the opportunity to share their experiences with cleaning up crime scenes due to the traumatic nature of recounting such experience. To our clients and those in Philadelphia who have lost someone to violence, we are all here because of you. We are honored and humbled to serve you. Thank you again for holding this hearing, for examining the additional burdens imposed by victims and survivors in the aftermath of their loved one's murder, and for allowing AVP to be here today at the table. We stand ready to assist in any way possible to help ensure victims and survivors in Philadelphia are served and supported to the best of our abilities. At AVP, we have a saying here, let the work speak for itself. On that note, I turn it over to my colleagues, Stephanie LeClaire and Sam Margolius. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Can you state your name for the record, please? Yeah, my name is Sam Margolius. Thank you. Begin your testimony, Stephanie. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Councilman Jones um, and, and everyone who has taken part in all of this work. Um, we want to start by just expressing again our gratitude for the opportunity to share the experiences of survivors who told their stories um, as part of this research in the hopes of making changes for families of homicide victims in the future. We also want to share, as Natasha just mentioned, that this content is incredibly traumatic and this presentation includes uh, quotations from survivors, graphic imagery, and descriptions of the scenes after uh, acts of violence across the city. We invite everyone to please take care of themselves if you're watching at home, if you've experienced violence personally, um, to please take care of yourself in whatever way you need to. So as, as we've mentioned, um, our key finding, one key finding in this research, next slide please, um, is that families in Philadelphia have been had the experience of cleaning crime scenes themselves. One family member shared this quote with us, and we want to start out by just sharing this. My family member had to go in there and clean off the walls before I went in so that I didn't see my, uh, my loved one's blood. 
So my family member, I told him, I said, I can't go back in there until we do some cleanup. He said, I'll go in. I didn't realize how. We all grew up together. Why would I think that he would be any stronger to do something like that than I would? Next slide. The experiences of survivors of homicide victims and their experiences of traumatic grief are well known across the city. Violence has risen to levels not seen in more than a quarter century and the daily acts of uh, shootings um, and homicides are exposed to everyone across the city. Um, but it's important to know all, all, many of the different ways that it impacts families and communities. Psychologically, all of this violence increases people's likelihood to experience PTSD, experience prolonged grief, experience depression, anxiety, substance use disorders. Socially, it has consequences of feelings of isolation, relationship conflict, stigma, shame. Physically, it has influences on the body that last for a long time and can lead to cancer, high blood pressure, heart problems, um, changes in weight, uh, increases and decreases, and economic challenges, including the loss of income from a loved one and an inability to work um, and to go on disability if, if necessary. Institutionally, people experiencing uh, homicide and violence also have ongoing institutional harms where they continue to experience engagement with the criminal justice system, experience lack of communication sometimes, and challenges in communication with law enforcement, um, experience unsolved cases, and in the case of crime scene cleanup, often have this experience of cleaning crime scenes themselves due to an institutional gap in practice. So families, when they return to the scene without any information, often find the bodily remains of their loved ones. This poses uh, physical health risks as they interact with blood and other bodily fluids. It, and it compounds people's trauma, as uh, Chairman Jones said, on the worst day of their life to be, to be interacting with um, their loved ones remains in this way. Next slide, please. Stephanie. Stephanie, can you? Sorry, I can't unmute and present at the same time, apparently. Okay, so in terms of the process, and Natasha mentioned this a little bit, so essentially once there is a homicide, the law enforcement and crime scene technicians go to the scene and collect evidence and um, ask questions of the witnesses. And then later, the deceased is taken to the medical examiner's office and the crime scene is left behind uh, with blood and bodily remains left behind. And at some point in this process, the survivors are notified, which is the first level of trauma. So once the crime scene technicians and the um, police department leaves the crime scene, again, leaving all the bodily fluids and remains behind, the survivors then return to the scene often they are not notified of what's awaiting them in the crime scene. And that's another level of trauma when they come in and see the blood of their loved one everywhere. Now in the fourth step, as we mentioned, most of them, most of the survivors clean the crime scene themselves. Um, there is another process that, could, that they could go through, which is hire a professional cleanup company for $2,000 to $20,000, which we are gonna talk about more why there are barriers to this. Let me stop you. Repeat yeah. that price. Um, and we're going to go over it again. Um, it's $2,000 to $20,000. Um, so either way, whether they go through a professional company or they clean the crime scene themselves, there are different levels of trauma that we'll talk about. And then we're going to go through um, the barriers for why um, survivors do not end up hiring professional cleanup services and end up cleaning up the crime scene themselves. So who does this impact? And Natasha mentioned this. Um, if we look at the, the victims of homicides for the last five years, so 2016 to 2020, 93% of homicide victims were either Black or Hispanic victims. 
Um, and that's true regardless of what part of the city we're looking at. If we look at a specific zip code and we look at the demographics of the area, Black and Hispanic uh, victims are disproportionately impacted by homicides, even in specific regions of Philadelphia. Now, if we look at this figure, we also have, um, we can also see that the dark orange areas are where we have the 90 or more homicides in the last five years. And if we look at the poverty rates, those lighter areas right here are where we have, um, like the lightest two blue areas are where we have poverty, high poverty, sorry, the darker areas are where we have high poverty rates uh, with the darkest area uh, being 20 to 47% below poverty rates. And then the next lighter area being um, up to 55% poverty rate. And then, um, and then crime scene cleanup doesn't just impact homicide victims, it also impacts any survivors of violent crimes. And as we know, we had a lot of shootings last year, so 2,167, each of those generates a crime scene. So we're talking specifically about homicides today, but this impacts any uh, victim of a violent crime. So what what happens when people come home and part of this process we're going to go into a few of the barriers that families and communities face in cleaning up services cleaning up um, accessing professional cleanup services so one is that cleaning up a crime scene is an immediate need in the hours after a crime occurs um, families in this in this time are in a, an acute state of traumatic shock people discuss experiences of feeling like nothing is real going into um, feeling like they're up out of their bodies. And during this time, we know that neurologically people are cut off from parts of the brain that are critical for planning, for organizing, for um, for working memory, for language. Um, research, uh, so the, the next stage of this process is that people also have to research providers, right? Families would have to be put in the position of of knowing that companies exist and then figuring out themselves how to how to find them, contact them. The next step of the process, having spoken to crime scene cleanup companies, is that they actually ask very detailed questions about the nature of the crime. They ask detailed questions about the caliber of the weapon that was used, about the extent of bodily remains at the scene. Um, and these are questions and information that families may have not known and may have no interest in knowing or may be desperate to forget. But the process right now of even recounting those details adds further trauma to the experience, even if they did research companies. At the same time, this is all happening at a time when families are necessarily reaching out to each other and coordinating and trying to muster um, the energy to coordinate funeral arrangements and a, and a host of other things um, on top of the financial burden of of organizing funerals and and taking care of medical bills. Um, next slide, please. As Stephanie mentioned, the cost out of pocket, the expectation also is that people would have to pay this out of pocket and the cost is two to twenty thousand uh, dollars. Two local crime scene cleanup companies gave that that range. Um, the, Communities that are hardest hit by homicides, you can see here on the right, also have median household incomes for the year that range from 20,000 to roughly 35,000. So the, the out-of-pocket cost is exorbitant and prohibitive, making private crime scene cleanup companies inaccessible. Next slide. So one of the ways that is that uh, survivors are expected to pay for crime scene cleanup is through private insurance. Um, so either homeowners insurance or renters insurance. Now, if we look at the um, rate of home ownership in Philadelphia, we'll see that the lighter areas are where there are less percent of less percent of the population owns their home, and that's where most of the homicides took place in the last five years. Um, additionally, uh, we know that there is a racial own home ownership gap where only 49% of black Philadelphians own their, own their homes and 76% of white Philadelphians own their homes. Now, in the case where Philadelphians rent their homes, which is about 48% of Philadelphians, uh, renter's insurance is typically narrow and may not cover a crime scene cleanup. 
So VCAP is a system set up for reimbursing crime victims for expenses after, after a crime is experienced. People may not have information on VCAP at the time when a crime occurs um, and can receive reimbursement for up to two years. And Crime Scene Cleanup is a service that can be reimbursed through VCAP. However, the maximum reimbursement is $500, which hasn't been changed in over 20 years. And these, uh, this reimbursement is only eligible for crime scenes that happen inside of a private residence. So that excludes cars, um, homicides or shootings that happen inside a, pri inside a private building, but it, uh, uh, an apartment building, for example, but in a hallway, um, and, any, and any shooting that may happen outside, which is the vast majority of, of violent crime scenes. As a result, VCAP in the past three years has only reimbursed eight, client, eight claims for crime scene cleanup on average per year across the whole state. Could you repeat that for the record? VCAP for the past three years on average has reimbursed eight claims for crime scene cleanup across the whole state. Do you happen to know how many from Philadelphia? I do not. Thank you. So after our research, we decided to come up with policy recommendations. The first policy recommendation is that uh, we mandate city agencies to responding to crime scene to assume the logistical and financial responsibility of removing biohazardous materials. Uh, in our research report, we propose two different options for doing this. Either the city runs its own biohazard remediation team um, that cleans up the crime scenes, or two, we the city uses the same model that they're using for the tow rotational um, model, where we the city sets regulations for um, crime scene companies that they have to follow and standards, and then uh, op then the law enforcement dispatches different crime scene companies that are, have a contract with the city. And we offer in this new report two pilot opportunities to, to take action immediately. One is that eight zip codes in Philadelphia highlighted on the right account for 55% of the homicides over the past five years, just those eight zip codes. So more than half of the homicides happen in these eight zip codes. Um, and one pilot opportunity is to respond with crime scene cleanup in just these zip codes, hardest hit by homicide that also experienced some of the highest rates of poverty in the city. Could you um, state those zip codes again? Yes, um, they are 19134, 19140, 19132, 19143, 19139, 19124, 19121, and 19133. Thank you. Absolutely. Another uh, pilot that we propose is because families are more likely to experience and interact with crime scenes when a crime, uh, when a homicide happens inside the home, is that the city of Philadelphia responds to crime scenes that happen, uh, homicides that happen inside of a private residence. These homicides are also more frequently uh, related to intimate partner violence and have child victims, adding complexity for and trauma for families to navigate. Um, and so that is another pilot opportunity and roughly 20% of homicides inside the city of Philadelphia happen inside of a private residence. I'm gonna read this quote also um, from one of the survivors uh, related to our second policy recommendation. It'd be nice if somebody told me what I was going to, uh, what I was getting ready to walk into or said, hey, let me go get that for you. You don't wanna see that or something, but nothing. I mean, when the homicide detectives told me that I could go down there and retrieve the stuff, I wasn't picturing I had to go to a bloody vehicle and grab everything. This policy recommendation is to institute trauma-informed and culturally sensitive training and policies that enhance law enforcement's communication with survivors of homicide and victims of crime. Particularly, families that described um, as this quote exemplifies experiences of not being warned before going back to their home or not being told 
uh, that when they went to retrieve loved ones' belongings from the car, that it was still sitting in a pool of blood. Um, there's opportunities that can be taken immediately to support law enforcement's communication with survivors and reduce ongoing harm that families experience after a, after a loved one is killed. And our last recommendation, policy recommendation number three, is to increase accessibility of information on crime scene cleanup for Philadelphians by providing comprehensive resources that educate and support survivors. Um, so two recommendations um, in here would be that one, the city puts out guidelines for crime scene cleanup. So how survivors should be handling crime scene cleanup and disposing of the waste. Um, an example of that is done by the New York City Health Department. And then another recommendation is that um, the city provides a list of all the biohazard remediation providers in the city. And Florida Health um, Services have done that in um, their own uh, city, cities. And again, thank you so much for to the Committee on Public Safety for hearing. Um, stories of, of people who've experienced crime scene cleanup and this important issue. We really appreciate all of the attention that's being brought to this and, and violence that's happening across the city. It, and it's really needing urgent attention. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to share these, these um, stories and important experiences. Thank you for your testimony. Could you please bear with us, be patient and stick around. We have um, two urgent hard stops and then we want to get everybody's testimony on the record, uh, committee members. So we're going to hold questions until everyone testifies, if that is okay with the committee. Um, hearing no major objections, I hope. Um, Sam Mantha, can you uh, read the next group to testify? So that Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes. This Councilman Johnson, this one to be recognized as band president. Thank you so much, Member Johnson. Um, this is one of your issues. So uh, this this might be something you consider for your Office of Victims. Something really that needs possibly to be housed there, sir. So uh, with that, Samantha, can you read the next group that you want to testify? Kathy Buckley and Deborah Sandifer. Thank you for your presentation. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, everyone, uh, Councilman Jones and the council members. My name is Kathy Buckley. I'm the director of the Office of Victim Services at the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. Uh, my office oversees the implementation of the Victims' Compensation Program, or better known as VCAP. I'm accompanied by our Chief Legal Counsel, Deborah Sandifer, as she's instrumental part of our Victims' Compensation Program. I'll uh, pause for Deborah to introduce herself as well. Good morning, everyone. Deborah Sandifer here again, I'm Chief Counsel at the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So um, just, just to add on to what Deborah had just mentioned, we rely on uh, Deborah's expertise to ensure that our program operates within the crime victim statute and regulations that govern our program. So on behalf of the agency, we thank you for providing us the opportunity to speak with you today about crime scene cleanup, one of the many uh, expenses that our program provides financial assistance to victims of crime. As way of background, our uh, program was established as a reimbursement program and is governed by the Crime Victims Act, uh, which is a state law that provides guidelines for eligibility and the benefits offered through Victims' Compensation Program. The Act also provides for funding the program through a $35 assessment on every criminal offender convicted or who has pled guilty in Pennsylvania. No state tax dollars are used to fund the program. Our program also receives an annual Victims of Crime Act grant from the Federal Office for Victims of Crime that also partially supplements the cost of the fund. So between those two things, those are the two main sources of funding for our program. 
that uh, federal grant is generated by fees on criminal offenders at the federal level. States with compensation programs are eligible to receive this funding. So together, these streams are what are used to support approximately 11 to $13 million in awards that are issued annually to victims of crime through Pennsylvania. So currently, to be eligible for uh, victim's compensation in Pennsylvania, victims must generally meet the following requirements for the law. One, they must report the crime to proper authorities within 72 hours or file a protection from the disorder. They must cooperate with law enforcement, prosecution, and the compensation program. And they must file a claim within two years from the date of the crime. According to the law, the benefits available for reimbursement through the compensation program include counseling, crime scene cleanup, forensic rate examination, funeral expenses, loss of earnings, loss of support, medical expenses, relocation expenses, replacement of personal health items that have been stolen or damaged, such as a cane, dentures, a walker, stolen cash, transportation expenses. Hold it. Can we can we check our mute buttons? I hear keystrokes, possibly stenographer type. If we could check our mute button. Thank you. Begin. Continue. Thank you. In general, the maximum amount that can be paid through victims' compensation is thirty five thousand dollars per claim. However, there are three specialized exceptions to that. One is an additional $1,000 may be paid for a forensic rate examination above the $35,000. Up to $10,000 is available for counseling and up to $500 is available for crime scene cleanup. State law requires our program to only pay up to $500 for crime scene cleanup expenses of a private resident. According to the statute, Cleaning means to remove or attempt to remove blood and stains caused by bodily fluids, food, paint, or other materials used to deface property within a private residence or other dirt and debris caused by the processing of a crime scene. A private residence uh, includes a house, apartment, condominium, mobile home, or other personal living space. So they don't have to own, they can also be living there and rent. Anyone, including a landlord or property manager who assumes the responsibility to pay for the crimes, cleanup of a crime scene is eligible for reimbursement. So eligible expenses include the cost of cleaning supplies uh, that are purchased for cleaning the scene, the cost of any necessary equipment purchased or rented, and the cost of professional labor for cleaning the crime scene. Overall, crime scene cleanup makes up a very small portion of our request to VCAP. We would welcome your feedback and comments on the Crime Victims Act in relation to crime scene cleanup so that we are able to pass them on to members of the General Assembly for their consideration. We appreciate the opportunity to present uh, to this council and we'll be happy to pause and answer any questions that you may have. I recognize that you said you wanted to hold that, uh, but Deborah and I are available right now to start answering those if, if that's okay with you. So, um, Samantha, Samantha, yes, I'm here. Um, is this a in interlude where we can actually ask questions or are we pressed to get the other panelists to testify? We can take questions now. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Uh, members of the committee, I will allow you guys to go before me. I have some specific questions if you have them. Is there anyone in the chat feature, Sam, that wants to be recognized? Councilmember Dom had questions. Councilmember Dom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My questions was for the prior panel. So let me wait till, uh, I know they have a time frame. Let me wait till uh, all the panels are done. Are there any others, Samantha? Council member Gautier had a comment. Member Gautier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to, to thank the panel, um, AVP in particular, um, and all of their, um, all of the, the people who shared their stories and contributed to that report. 
Um, I really didn't understand how this aspect of homicides, uh, how that works in our city until you started this work, um, Chairman Jones, and it's mind boggling to me. And I think that we have to support our citizens in a better way. And so I just thank you, uh, thank AVP for the report. I thank you for this hearing and I look forward to being a part of an immediate solution to change this situation and support people, particularly in our black and brown neighborhoods um, much better. Thank you so much, Member Gaudier. Uh, you and I share a strange, not just our borders uh, within our council districts, but the murder rates within our, our districts as well. So, um, well, let, let's dive right in. So, two things. One, and anyone can answer these questions. It, if I understood everyone correctly, it is private residents apartments and houses and um, motor vehicles uh, that are eligible, also cars. Is that correct? No, that is not correct. The, um, the, the uh, excuse me, again, Deborah Sandifer, the, the Crime Victims Act speaks to private residents. And, not and that includes uh, what some of the things you did uh, mention, uh, Council Member Jones, um, homes, rentals, um, but it is, the word is residence, which does not include a motor vehicle. Okay. And it's also inside the residence, so not the porch or not the outside of the house or garden or anything like that. So the vast majority of people, as I remember in the testimony, are shot on the streets of Philadelphia. They're not eligible. Correct. Correct? All right. Um, so in the case where can you help me to understand why only eight people in the Commonwealth were eligible for the $500 uh, reimbursement? I can speak to some of that, Councilman Jones. Um, I can tell you that uh, we've had approximately 500 um, claims submitted for crime scene cleanup across the Commonwealth from 2018 to 2020. However, there's a, a number of caveats with that. Um, I think uh, Sam and Stephanie, I appreciate their comments and explanations and, and their advocacy because their presentation uh, was really uh, articulate. Part of what our claims include is they're part of an uh, overall general claim process. So they may have applied for other types of expenses such as counseling. Um, or they could have been claims that were filed for property crime and then checked off crime scene cleanup, not knowing that their claim in and of itself was not eligible. So what we do not have um, the information to provide you today is identifying out of those 500 claims to over 200 out of Philadelphia, which ones may have been approved, um, which ones have not because they weren't eligible, and then also identifying those that have been approved, but maybe um, we uh, are waiting for the documentation to come forward. Um, and also out of that 200, some of them, as uh, Sam and Stephanie had mentioned, they're not within a private residence. We didn't have time to go through all of those claims prior to this meeting to give you that information. So, I mean, without, I mean, listen, I've learned uh, as a, a member that has been around a couple of years now, that I don't want to point fingers, I want to point to solutions. How do we get, unfortunately, I, I would hope to stop the murder so we need, need not have um, claims placed. But if, if we're going to deal with this um, pandemic of homicides, how do we get better at reimbursements to exceed eight? We get eight in a weekend sometimes in Philadelphia. So how, what, what, if you were advising people, us in Philadelphia and, and people, how do we get better results out of that particular f pool of dollars? And I'm going to get to why only $500 next, but could you answer that? I would uh, respond that um, our program has to operate within the guidelines of the law and the statute. So we're extremely uh, limited on, on how we make, what we can make decisions on, and that includes the $500. Uh, 
Um, we can't pay more than $500 because that's all that's allowable under the Crime Victims Act. So until the statute is changed where that's how, you know, the parameters we have to operate under. So if, if I understood you correctly, we need to reach out to our state legislators to take a look at updating um, this particular statute. That would be correct to expand the eligibility and uh, the amount of expenses. That's what would need to um, be done in order to allow us to pay more. I will also add that it's important for this body to know that whenever we expand and increase the uh, amount of money, we also have to think about how we're going to generate revenue into the program um, or else we will continue to pay more than what we're bringing in. And I think uh, at the beginning, uh, I, as you heard, I, our program is mainly funded on a $35 assessment on offenders. So um, and we need to increase other types of revenue coming in so we can expand or else the program in, in the near future will not be able to sustain itself. Understood and duly noted. Um, but if we look at um, $35 assessment on a person who commits a homicide, I'm gonna look there as well, uh, but all right. Um, are there any other questions from the panel members? Yes, I have a question. M Member Johnson. Yes, well, uh, uh, and so my question is regarding who qualifies for um, the reimbursement when there's a homicide. Um, I know there's there's been a little controversy in the victim's advocacy um, community regarding like if a young man just happens to be living some type of lifestyle, uh, but his life is taken, but could have a mom who's, you know, um, low income or struggling to pay for their funeral expenses and has nothing to do with her son's actions, but um, the son will not qualify because of his actions uh, may have been criminal or have contributed to his death. Has that issue ever been addressed? And also, have there any been any movements regarding raising the reimbursement for funeral costs? And then also, is there education around all these other services that are provided to victims who have lost loved ones to gun violence? Because some of the things that were just mentioned is, is new to me, besides the funeral um, services reimbursement. Anyone can answer that question? I would like a comment um, on the uh, contributory piece. Uh, um, if Please council state person, your name again. state your name again. Deborah, Deborah Sandifer. This is Deborah Sandifer, Chief Counsel from uh, PCCD Commission on Crime and, and Delinquency. Um, the Crime Victims Act requires the VCAP program to consider the contributory conduct of the victim. It, it actually requires the program to consider that, to assess that when making determinations about the award that would go to whoever the claimant. So if we're talking about a homicide victim and that, that claimant is a loved one, a family member, um, that is what the program is required to do, um, again, by, by law. And since I have been at the agency for five years now, one of the things that we try to do is we work very much in concert with the program and we actually sit down and review uh, cases. Uh, some, you know, with every different fact pattern, there is something that, you know, you need to work through and you need to talk about. So when we're sitting around the table, we have people who are from the program who have a particular kind of training and discipline. You have myself and, and probably one other attorney from my office with our different perspective. And, and we talk through things. And I think we're very proud of our results in that regard because it's we're talking about life experiences. We're talking about, you know, the other attorney has 30 years as a, a public defender. I have had a varied existence um, in, in the criminal justice system. And that's basically the, the way that we do it. I wanted to make a comment also about the, the funeral expenses. That would be something very similar to the crime scene cleanup. The Crime Victims Act requires 
that there be a cap on that amount. So again, if that number were to change, that would, would have to come through the General Assembly. To your recollection, what's the cap on the fuel reimbursement? I believe, is it 6,000, Kathy? It's 6,500. 6,500. And do these things, either or, or and, can you have both when you check those boxes? Or is there a cap on that? So can, can you get a funeral reimbursement and can you get a crime cleanup reimbursement? Yes, you can. You can get both. There's just a cap on both, as we mentioned, 6,500 and then 500. The total claim in and of itself can be at least 35,000 if they also come in for counseling and those types of things. All right. Yeah, see, Mr. Chair, this is very, very helpful information. You know, obviously we're working through the details regarding the Office of Victim Advocates, and so we'll be working um, very closely with you, Kathleen and Deborah, as we um, formulate our rollout, and as well as I'm working with Senator Anthony Hardy Williams and Sharif Street regarding um, the Office of Victim Advocate on the state level. I know y'all have a vacancy right now and looking for candidates to replace um, Jennifer Storm, but some of this information, um, besides just being reversed, being besides being reimbursed for funeral expenses um, is new information for me. And so I just want to do a follow-up and more of a deeper dive just so when we're dealing with our constituents, like in terms of trauma counseling, which is very, very important and critical, right? I've never had the opportunity to offer that particular service. And so I guess the other part is when you're working with police departments, and I guess I'm only thinking about the city of Philadelphia, but you represent the state. So it's, is police departments across um, the state of PA. How do you engage in the training component with those police departments to make sure they're getting this information out? Because I don't, at least I've been doing this work for at least um, 20 years as an activist, but 10 years as an elected official. And I haven't heard a community relations officer say, well, you can receive trauma support services for free or get reimbursed as a as a also part of um, you know you addressing the homicide that may have taken place and so how, how does that work if i might speak this is deborah sandifer again before i turn uh, most of your question council person johnson over to kathy buckley i want to finish out something else about the contributory conduct piece what i didn't say and i should have was that the crime victims act also requires that there are certain circumstances where we do not and cannot consider contributory conduct. And when you mentioned counseling, that's what it brought it to my mind. When it comes to a claim for counseling submitted by a loved one of a homicide victim, we cannot and do not consider the contributory conduct of a victim. That is also the case in the area of certain sexual assaults. We cannot and do not consider the contributory conduct of the victim. And with that, I, I think Kathy Buckley can speak to um, what things that the program does and, and, and trains on in order to get information out to the public through police officers. So um, in Philadelphia specifically, we work with the victim assistance officers in each of the police districts. And they then uh, inform and, and work with their, uh, with their colleagues within law enforcement Law enforcement under the Crime Victims Act is required to hand out basic information to crime victims. And that includes the base uh, information on the basic rights, uh, availability of compensation is on this form, and then also information about some local victim service programs. Because first and foremost, we rely heavily on law enforcement and programs such as AVP. Uh, because they're our extension. We would not meet and get to as many victim service, uh, victim um, and survivors of, of crime if it wasn't for the great work that they do. So in, in terms of law enforcement, that's, and we're ramping up some additional training that we're going to be doing in the near future to go over the handing out of that law enforcement information, but so continual type of process that we engage in. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Member Johnson. I, I just want to thank you for the work that you guys do at the state level. I am very much aware of it, but we can always do better. We can 
always look to statutes that need to be updated. Um, uh, the cost of a funeral, but more importantly, the cost to ongoing trauma uh, is is extensive. And in our districts, uh, whether you talk about the, the, the third district, the second district, the fourth district, we see it every day. Um, and to know and be fully aware that all of these programs exist, even if they need to be updated, is better than drawing a blank when we talk to a victim uh, and, and or a survivor of a crime. Mm -hmm. and, and so we need you uh, and we need to for you to guide us on how we can be helpful uh, in dealing with that. Um, are, are, were there any other questions? Of the, um, yes, Mr. Chair, I have a question. Quick question. Let's go, let's go with Dom first, um, Member Green, and then you. Member Dom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everyone, for your testimony today. I have a question. I think it's to Sam Modulis. Um I think you mentioned, Sam, that eight zip codes have the highest homicide rate in the city right now. And was that, what was the percentage of, of what those homes, was that 55% of the homicide rates in those eight zip codes? Yes. Yeah, so we, we're looking at um, totals of homicide, not homicide rate, but total homicides from 2016 through 2020. And in those eight zip codes accounted for 55%. Um, with a big gap between those eight zip codes, uh, I think the the, the eighth zip code had 90 or more homicides, and the next highest zip code had about six, mid in the middle of the 60s. 60, yeah, 67. 67. Mm -hmm. And is, it, is, is can you share with the chair those zip codes and the percentages that we can distribute them? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's in the report as well. Um, we distributed I, would like to, to, I would like to send that report to the members of this committee. If it's also helpful, I would love to share, and as part of the report, we looked at um neighboring state reimbursements for crime scene cleanup and looked at new jersey reimburses for crime scene cleanup up to four thousand new york reimburses up to 2500 and delaware up to a thousand just as uh, comparable states in the region and the other question i had was on i, I saw a chart i'm not sure i understood it totally you're talking about home ownership rates i believe mm -hmm. Is it, was that a correlation between the home ownership rates and the homicide rate yes yeah, so the, on that um, map, the dots were homicides, and then the colors indicated the percent of home ownership. And were those home ownership rates lower in those zip codes? Exactly. Yes. yes. Okay. All right, thank you very much for testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that's because you, membership is, is identified as the real, the, the primary source of payment that could put the out-of-pocket cost uh, for families, right? So the the ten to the two to twenty thousand um, typically comes from homeowners insurance if they have it. And let me ask you one last question: Do you think if we had a focus on those eight zip codes, not just for crime prevention but also for promoting home ownership, that we could make a big impact? Absolutely. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member Dom. Member Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Council Member Dom's question um, somewhat echoed um, what I was going to ask. And I was curious in reference to other jurisdictions. You mentioned New Jersey, Delaware, New York. Uh, from your research in other parts of maybe the nation, how are other states funding this type of work? Specifically around crime scene cleanup? Correct. Um, so those are the, the numbers we have for states in the region on reimbursement. And unfortunately, what we found in doing some of our research was that the burden is, is most commonly placed on families to coordinate the logistics and to pay out of pocket. We didn't identify another uh, place where a locality, a municipality removed that burden. Um, and that's part of what we're advocating for the city of Philadelphia to do is because this is a prohibitive cost out of pocket, it's inaccessible and inequitable. Um, and so we're advocating that the city of Philadelphia take actions to remove these burdens, but we didn't find um, other places that, that do it better as a model. 
did you find other jurisdictions that provided more dollars in reference to reimbursement or other sources of funding? Yes. In, in addition to the ones in our region that we mentioned, um, California, Oregon, uh, more states out west, um, Ohio, I believe, was 750. And some reimburse slightly lower. For example, Maryland, I believe, is only $250. And what was the source uh, for those states that provided more money from reimbursement? Was that just either general fund or was it other uh, funding sources? I'm not aware. That's something, Member Green, we need to do a deeper dive on. Yes, the reason I asked that question, I think also through, uh, and Councilmember Johnson talked about the work he's doing with uh, Senators uh, Williams and Street. Also, um, through my role with Pennsylvania Municipal League, I would venture this is an issue not just for the city of Philadelphia, but other cities around um, the Commonwealth, including Norristown, Coatesville, Erie, Harrisburg, Pittsburgh, uh, Reading, who all have the same issues and concerns, uh, and there's not enough dollars for um, this issue, even at the reimbursement level. And so uh, to the extent that we can emulate what's been happening in other jurisdictions, other states at higher amounts of reimbursement, uh, that's something that could be helpful and beneficial. And I think other cities who've also been dealing with some of the same challenges, albeit not at the same level as the city of Philadelphia, uh, will be supportive of this type of work. Duly noted, Member Grimm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Are there any others to question this group of panelists? Council Member Gim had a question. Member Gim. Member Gim. Okay. Anyone else, um, Ms. Williams? No. So can you please repeat your recommendations? You, I think there were three. Can you restate them for us? Sure. So policy recommendation number one was that the city act to assume the logistical and financial responsibility for crime scene cleanup services. Um, we offer two models as opportunities to do that. One, by creating a team within the city, a biohazard removal team um, that could be housed in a city department and respond to scenes across the city. Another option that we recommend is the city rotational towing program as a model that uses dispatch to send towing companies to scenes across the city and to have a similar model for pricing structures, um, and regulations and crime scene cleanup companies to respond across the city, private companies that already exist and provide the service. Um, and we offer two pilots within that policy recommendation, one for those eight zip codes and one to respond to private residences um, where homicides happen. Policy recommendation two was um, to enact training and policies on trauma-informed care and cultural sensitivity for law enforcement um, and policy number three was to increase access to information on what's involved in crime scene cleanup um, at the city level so that families are aware of information relevant to the health risks, relevant to accessing uh, private services to avoid the ongoing trauma and physical harm. Uh, I like there's there's code exemption as well. What, was, what, what, what number was that? The eight zip codes? The eight zip codes was one of the pilot opportunities. Was to was to uh, to focus on the eight zip codes hardest hit by homicide that also experience high rates of poverty. So I I, I want to consider that one of your recommendations and definitely want to bring that to the attention of city departments. Mr. Chair, I have a point of information. Point of information recognized, Council Member Green. For those three. Um, suggestions that you made in reference to uh, logistics, the access to information as well as the pilot. Um, do you have a range of costs for those three pilot areas? We do. And, and we are sharing, in addition to the report that will be shared with City Council, um, there's a memo accompanying it with, uh, with our best ranges of estimated costs associated with each. And, and for the record, can you just state the range of costs for each of the three and then all in for all three? Um, 
So the national estimated average per crime scene uh, cleanup service is two thousand to forty five hundred dollars. So the or twenty five hundred to four thousand, excuse me. Um, so for let me pull um, pull it up, Stephanie. You may have it more accessible than I do. Um, but for the responding to homicides that happen in just those eight zip codes, um, roughly from my memory, it was around 450,000 to 790,000 to respond and remove the biohazardous material just from those zip codes. And that's annually based off of homicide totals over the past five years. Um, it would be less than that for just responding to homicides inside a private residence. I'm oh, sorry, I have the numbers. Um, for the pilot for the eight, um, eight zip codes that are hardest hit by homicides, um, the range was $497,500 to $796,000 annually. Um, and for the private residential? Yeah, for that one, it was 210000 to 336000 per year. So, um, in addition, Samantha? Samantha, yeah. we want to ask here. the Philadelphia Police Department what they do when it comes to outdoor public space homicide cleanups. The Philadelphia Police Department is here and testifying next. Well, there you go. All right. Uh, and one final point, um, Council Member, uh, Mr. Chair, did you provide any information on the, the range of cost for logistics um, piece of your proposal? Um, I don't believe that we do. Those costs are only associated for removing the crime scene, uh, okay. for removing biohazards. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member Green. And with that, uh, thank you for your testimony, insightful. Um, however disturbing, um, but that's why, that's why we're here to deal with the hard issues. Yes. Um, I oh. just wanted to say that I am, I'm back. I, I think I missed my oh. cue and I apologize. All right. Would you like to question this panel? Yes. I just had I just, a couple of questions. For for him. And I think that the stenographer is unmuted. So yeah. if our stenographer could mute, that would be helpful. Thank you. Go ahead, Member Graham. I mean, Member Kim. No problem. Um, so please I, mute, I or please mute. Yes. Check your thank mute you. button, please. All right. Thank you. Um, first of all, you know, I want to thank uh, the the resolution sponsor and the um, and the chair and our you know colleagues for um, you know for having this important discussion and certainly think that the pilot program is an important area for us to to push further on. But in the meantime, it does still sound like there are issues within the broader state program um, that we are working to supplement. And I just want to make sure that we are going to be pushing hard to uh, make changes in the state program um, that expand opportunities. Certainly, it, it calls upon us uh, to support our own uh, victim witness service agencies here locally to be able to advertise uh, the compensation fund and, and supports, especially for homicide victims or shooting victims, um, where, you know, where there's the likelihood of seeing uh, so much um, potential, you know, uh, property issues and everything. Um, so a couple of the questions that I had uh, were around how VCAP VCAP has certain requirements that, that um, have come to us that have been of concern. And I just want to double check those to you. So among those is that you cannot access the VCAP funds if you, if you are considered to be involved in a crime and that you, the victim must be in cooperation with the prosecution. Is that accurate? And could you just talk a little bit more about how that impacts um, people's access to the fund for this particular situation around cleanup? 
this is Deborah Sandifer again, Chief Counsel PCCD. Um, I, I think the language in the, the Crime Victims Act is that in order for um, claimants to be eligible, they have to cooperate with uh, law enforcement. So it's, it's not quite um, uh, specified that it'd be with the prosecution. It is just cooperate with law enforcement. And that has been interpreted to mean any number of things from uh, being available for interviews and phone calls and participating in investigation and revealing information that is known. But what is also true is that the Crime Victims Act recognizes um, that there are some situations where individuals, where these uh, the claimants would not be um, able to participate. And it, and it sets out things like uh, that, that the program is to consider when looking at eligibility and lack of cooperation, such as uh, the, a determination made about safety um, and, th and that sort of thing. So that is one way that the, the Crime Victims Act speaks to that and, and requires cooperation unless there is some reason for a lack of cooperation, including safety or danger to the claimant. And is that like determined by, is, is that determined by a detective or who makes that determination? It's a, I would say it's a collaborative effort. The, the program itself makes the decisions and the, the, the final arbiter, if you will, would be my office, the Office of Chief Counsel with VCAP when there is a question. But what happens with respect to law enforcement is that the program um, examines reports and that sort of thing that do come from police departments. They, of course, are in communication with claimants who make their, their, their appeal for the award directly to the program. Um, and that's how the determination is, is made. It's made at, at the program level. Do you feel like victims would agree that the program is collaborative? In other words, that their testimony or their claim would weigh as heavily as like, you know, uh, I, there's, if, the, if, for example, a detective was unresponsive or if the PPD were unresponsive. I'm, I'm not sure what you're asking, but I really can't speak to what a victim would feel about the program, but I don't, I don't know if I'm heading off in a different direction, but there, there are opportunities for the claimant to speak directly with the person handling the claim. And if, if there's okay. an, an adverse decision, if you will, there's the opportunity to request reconsideration. And then there's also the, the opportunity to request an appeal before a, a hearing examiner at the at the state department level. I'm not sure if that's answering your question. Well, what I'm saying is, is that there have been adverse reactions, right? Like I think my earlier colleague said that Philadelphia claims have been rejected, denied, denied. I don't have a full amount of data on it. Is that accurate? Again, there were not sure. claims it, it, by Philadelphians requesting assistance into the program. They were denied or deemed ineligible. Ineligible, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Ineligible for what For what basis? Well, I, I don't I think don't. so. I, I, I guess that's the question. Is anyone reviewing some of the claims that were asked for why, they're, why these victims were deemed ineligible? Do, they, do you even have data on the percent of claims you know, that have been requested and then reimbursed. I mean, there's only been eight. I assume that there have been more claims. Oh, so you're, you're, I'm sorry, this is Kathy Buckley, if I may uh, intervene. Um, so you're talking about the crime scene cleanup claims? Correct. Okay. Oh. So yeah, there's a number of claims that may have been approved through crime scene cleanup, but we haven't paid yet. Um, so in order for us to kind of gauge the number of claims those are involved, we would need more time to go through. They may have been already paid for other types of expenditures like therapy or funeral expenses and so forth. And maybe we're still waiting for documentation on the crime scene cleanup. Do that does happen quite often. But do you other, have data from a prior year? Do you? Can you just give me like 2019 data? 
Now that's that's the hard part. We would need time to go through our claims because there are multiple types of expenses that the claims can be paid on. So we would have to go make sure we're going through the claims uh, pretty thoroughly to ensure that we're looking at everything correctly um, to identify those that have been paid on and what expenses and then those that have not. Some of the crime scene expenses may not have been paid because they weren't eligible because maybe it wasn't at the private residence. So hence, that's where the, the statute comes into play about where we're allowed to pay and where we're not allowed to pay. So and one of I the things that I just want to underscore is, first of all, you know, I want to underscore on behalf of our entire city and our city council body that, you know, this fund is very important to us and we appreciate the work that everybody does there. This hearing is specifically about crime scene cleanup. So, yes, all my questions were about crime scene cleanup. Okay. One of the things that we feel is difficult um, or I have experienced challenges uh, at the state level is that we don't typically do data analysis. Um, we are discussing here in the absence of current state funding and perhaps restrictive measures around VCAP that do not allow Philadelphians to access it, that we may have to pilot that money on our own. You know, potentially that's under discussion right now, right? Like that's been a request that's been made, a recommendation that's been made by certain individuals who are on here. and. You know, one of the things that that we want to understand is that um, the state needs to be doing a better job around this. We cannot actually do a better job if we don't have data. So it seems that, you know, uh, Mr. Chair, one of the things you would want to request from the state is a relatively comprehensive review of claims, not just things that have been dispersed, but claims that were made, um, you know, a data analysis uh, about, um, you know, I, I would like to know uh, by race, by uh, zip code or location or, or neighborhood, however it's located. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the most ideal sense, a little bit of a quality control investigation in terms of whether uh, claims were deemed ineligible under what basis, you know, some kind of category of basis. So that if we are finding patterns that seem unreasonable or in, in the case of the city of Philadelphia, which has seen so many uh, families and communities who are, um, you know, who are, you know, either way, it doesn't matter if you're involved in a crime or not or, or not. Um, you know, we need these communities, these neighborhoods, um, you know, need assistance because many of them are happening in places where clearly a $4,500 crime scene cleanup cannot be managed by many of them. And um, thus people are re-traumatized over and over again. So my question is, uh, is this information that, that I was discussing, which is kind of a comprehensive review of claims around crime scene cleanup, because that's what this uh, hearing is about, um, are reviewed by race, by zip code, by location, and then by whether if they were deemed ineligible, which the majority of them obviously are since the state doesn't distribute around this, under what terms are they deemed ineligible? And that you could make that public so that we could better understand how to proceed. And, um, you know, I, I do not have a problem with pilot programs. I do not have a problem with advocacy. I do want to make sure that the work that we do um, and that, you know, the, the, the issues that are being brought forward here by many victims and victim families is something that the state will, will also be making adjustments for in their own programming. So it's not just Philadelphia paying into something, but actually we are changing the, the experience statewide for individuals who are victims of violence and require crime scene cleanup. Um, this is a traumatic issue for many families. I think we're, we're hearing that um, and have witnessed it certainly. And um, it feels almost, you know, almost in the realm of first responder kind of, uh, you know, kind of a mentality and trauma uh, serv trauma related type of services, right? 
um, to not force the family to have to either clean it up themselves um, or to be able to, you know, ha or to have to require them to, to reach beyond their means um, for it. Um, so that's the question. And it's, it's specifically asking about state level data. Do you do it? Do you have it? I think you have it. Do you review it? If you don't review it, when can you review it and give back to us a report? Madam, I mean, remember Gim, that was succinct. And I, I think the question is reasonable uh, for an answer. And so we will forward that officially uh, to your agency to give you time to gather that data for us. Right? Thank uh, you very much, Mr. Chair. No, thank you, Member Gim. Um, S Samantha, it is 11 o'clock. We have a hard stop at 1130. Can you bring the next group to testify? Uh, sure. And thank Michael you Michael Garvey. Oh. Go ahead, Sam. Uh, Michael Garvey is the next witness to testify. Are there any others after that? Yes, we do have um, eight witnesses after that. The hard stop is at 1230. So we have oh, okay. about an hour now. We have time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. State your name for the record and please begin your testimony. Absolutely, sir. Pardon me for one minute while I share my screen with you and then I will start. Thank you. Just want to check to see if it's sharing yet, sir. Yes, I think we're good. Excellent, sir. Seems to be frozen. Good morning, Chair Member Jones and other members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Michael Garvey, the Director of the Philadelphia Police Department's Office of Forensic Science. I'm here on behalf of Police Commissioner Outlaw regarding Resolution Number 210090. First, on behalf of Commissioner Outlaw, thank you for allowing the Police Department to be included in this discussion. The police department is aware of the topic of crime scene cleanup, which is a term applied to the proper cleanup of blood, bodily fluids, or other potentially infectious material after an incident, such as a homicide or other violent crime. It may also refer to the cleanup and repair of physical damage that has occurred to private or public property as a result of criminal activity, such as the shattering of glass or bullet holes into a wall. I would like to make the distinction between crime scene cleanup and crime scene processing. The police department is responsible for crime scene processing. On the identification of a crime scene, police officers secure the scene for processing. Once the appropriate legal authority has been obtained to process the scene, detectives or Office of Forensic Science Crime Scene Unit Examiners will document, photograph, and collect evidence. 
the crime scene unit responds to all homicides, officer involved shootings, and other complicated scenes. Detectives process other scenes, such as non fatal shootings. Typically, crime scene processing by a forensic examiner involves detailed notes, sketches, photographs, and possibly video to document the conditions of the scene and evidence. Evidence is collected to preserve its forensic value for future analysis. Once the crime scene has been fully processed with all evidence collected, the police department releases the scene. At this point, the crime scene responsibilities of the police department have ended. If the crime scene is located outside on a public street or sidewalk, the police department will at times request the services of the Philadelphia Fire Department to hose down the public space. Crime scenes on private property, whether interior or exterior, are not cleaned or repaired by the city. The cleanup and repair repair associated with these scenes is the responsibility of the person responsible for the, that property. Often these tasks fall onto the family members of the victim. Repair and cleanup may also be needed for secondary scenes. Bullets often strike other homes or cars, shattering windows and causing damage to neighboring properties. I'm sorry, uh, could I just Please pause here for one second, Mr. Chair? I, yes. I feel like it's important, um, while I appreciate the PowerPoint, I do feel like it's important that uh, we let the public know that there uh, are extremely graphic scenes here that are being presented and that people have a right to know ahead of the presentation. Um, you know, I know we got the, the PPD's PowerPoint uh, relatively late, but it feels important to let people know this is an important issue and we want uh, to express uh, the understanding that there is a tradition, a significant amount of trauma associated with this conversation, especially for those um, who are seeking a better path towards reimbursement. I just think it's important uh, for us to to very clearly state that this um, presentation has already shown and may continue to show uh, graphic scenes and that people who are uncomfortable with that, um, you know, this presentation may last. I don't, you know, I don't know how long uh, uh, the witness believes it may last, but I think it's important just to let people know um, so that they're not, uh, you know, further hurt by uh, this presentation. We can focus on the main, um, the main issue before us. Duly noted and um, you. actually empathetic. Um, how long is this presentation? It's probably going to last about maybe one more minute. I have about a paragraph or so, sir, and then hopefully we can get into questions and I will turn this off or I can turn it off now if you would like. Well, um, I, I'm going to err on the side of turning it off. Uh, and we can just, I mean, people have been victimized once uh, by the crime, twice by the uh, cleanup, three times by the trial. We don't want to continue that process. So why don't we go to Q&A if it's OK? Or if you can verbally finish your testimony. I can absolutely, sir. Right. So um, we were at the point of basically showing where there's often primary scenes and then there's often the other scenes where people's cars, homes that aren't at the primary scene also get struck. When we look at this, the Philadelphia police don't have the resources or personnel right now for our cleanups, nor do we have a list of contractors who we can tell people who they should actually reach out to. However, what we can say, we fully agree that based on the scenes that we see, we, we absolutely know there is a need for these services. People need these services, need the contact points, need the capability to clean up. 
Um, and with the surge in gun violence, many more people will continue to face this extreme burden to require their property to be cleaned, but also disinfected in a healthy and safe way. And anything that we can do talking about this here hearing, whether it's providing these services, providing the possibility to pay for these will help these people who are dealing with crime every single every single day. This was not part of my written testimony. However, after hearing the earlier people, I have to add on, sir, that um, the concept of training, I think, is a great one. Hearing the possibility to do more training for our crime scene officers and other officers who would be interacting with anyone to have them better prepared for how to deal with people, talk to them about what the scene may look like, to walk someone back in to that scene, to talk to that person in a calm way, uh, or possibly to help prevent them from not having to go back in to that scene. I think the training option that was talked about is an excellent idea, and I'm going to be taking that option of you know, back to our office. And basically that is something that we should be able to work on pretty quickly, sir. And with that, I will end for questions. Sorry about the graphic nature of that, but it was critical to show so many people don't realize what crime scenes look like and what it looks like after we leave. And that is the reality that so many people have to deal with after we're finished processing. We leave and they're left to clean up. If there are any questions. Yes, um, thank you for your testimony. A, a couple of things. One, um, how many of these outdoor, how many indoor crime scenes do you deal with annually last year, 2020? But how many do you deal with outside? Yeah, so that's, yeah, um, that's a hard question for me to give you an answer to right now. I can check. We typically don't track um, crime scenes, whether they're inside or whether they are in a public space. Um, I can try to um, pull basically that to count. We also have a mix of scenes that'll be both. They may start inside and move outside. They may start outside and moving inside. But if we look at it, 499 homicides and um, over 2,000 other gun violence scenes, that's a lot of scenes, but I can't answer the question on which ones were outside versus, you know, others. So we, let's assume out, outside. What, what is your process after gathering evidence as you cited in the presentation? And then at what point do you do cleanup? So uh, there is no cleanup process for the PPD. That is not part of the PPD's process. Once we process a scene, it is to only collect the evidence that needs to be brought back in to be tested. Anything else is left in place. Sometimes when it's an outside scene, we will call the fire folks in to hose it off, but there is no policy within PPD or any other place here for crime scene cleanup. That, like we've heard over and over again, falls on the people who are responsible for the property. So if I'm in a playground, what, and there's a homicide, what happens then? We would, we would basically process the scene. PPD, once we are finished with it, would turn that scene back over to Parks and Rec, and you know they would be the ones that would be cleaning it up after. Do they? So they don't use a professional cleaning up crew. That I do not know, sir. Do you? All right. So this is this is all right. In 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 a case of um, so so after you, 
after at a teddy bear memorial on a street, there might be blood, there might be uh, other uh, a tissue matter uh, that is associated with the gunshot. If it was, we, we just kind of hose it down and keep it moving. There's no program within PPD or any other place that pays or has the resources for crime scene cleanup. It is a critical problem area. Yes, sir. All right. Um, I'm, I appreciate the candor. Um, and so you don't have stats right now on how many times. So, so I assume if there were 499 homicides, there were 400 and 99 crime scenes. Yes, sir. There, so every homicide obviously has a scene. And then all of the non-fatal shootings, they all have crime scenes also. So every year we probably are at between two and 3,000 scenes. All right. Um, hmm. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Council Member Gim. Chair recognizes Council Member Gim. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just want to thank um, Mr. Garvey uh, for your, you know, um, you know, for the for the comments, and you know, certainly appreciate the work that the Philadelphia Police Department does. Um, you know, I think anybody who knows. Uh, <clears throat> the amount of harm that's been done across our city uh, regarding violence, but you know our police, our first responders, um, they witness uh, this, these scenes um, uncleaned up in any aspect, and um, and I, I hope it underscores for all of us the importance of providing um, expanding and expansive mental health supports, treatments, mandatory trauma training to help people deal with with the violence that they have to witness um you know uh and and just an under underlying you know underscoring yet again that uh violence is impacts people uh on a on a wide scale so um you know and again i appreciate the uh the communication of the severity of what we leave families and the broader public to deal with. Um, I just feel like it's important for us to warn people uh, before we see these scenes. And, um, you know, again, to use them judiciously, because I think uh, we want we want we want to focus in on what's what we need to do. Um, so, uh, you know, my question is, um, if you had a chance to listen to some of the earlier testimony, uh, some of the concerns and it does uh, you know, I know um, as a member of the department, um, you're advocating for an expansion. Do you reckon, are there other recommendations that kind of resonated with you in terms of how we can expand the state's responsibility to make sure that the Crime Victims Compensation Fund is, is more fully expansive and does include, you know, uh, concerns around crime scene cleanup? Were there other recommendations that resonated that you feel like we ought to be, um, you know, emphasizing? Sure. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, many of what was many of the items uh, really, truly hit home. Um, the idea that we can do a better job talking to the victims, talking to the people, sharing the information that is out there in a compassionate way, that goes directly to us, probably clarifying protocols but it also goes to training. So the topic of training, I think is an incredible one. One which we are already doing training in many areas to make sure that we are going to engage better with those that we serve. So the training piece, critical. Um, having us have a list, perhaps that is vetted by the city that we would be able to provide because right now we can't provide names of a company because we can't favor one company versus some other company. However, if there was an approved list by the city, like you already heard earlier, like the tow trucks, then perhaps we would even be able to provide that. If 
there was a way for these people to not have to do the cleanup, to not have to go in and plan that cleanup, talking to a private company, of course, that would be a great option too. Obviously, many of these things, while they don't fall into the PPDs, you know, sort of what's our processing, we absolutely realize the trauma that looking at a crime scene can have on a person. I have to routinely look at my crime scene, um, my crime scene team, and actually think about the number of scenes they go to, even in one night, the number of scenes they go to in a week, the number of scenes that they go to over the course of a year, and the trauma that gives them. By the same token, someone who lost a son, child of any kind, that's adding on to that trauma. So anything that we can actually do to help that process, we should. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Garvey. Thank you, Member Gim. Um, so what, what I'd like to do is allow you to um, kind of uh, put together recommendations. Um, and, and I don't know if it should be housed in the police department, whether it should be housed in the health department, uh, whether it's something that members of the morgue or people who pick up bodies should do, but that should be standardized uh, and not just left to happenstance. I, I dread teddy bear memorials, but I dread the fact that we haven't cleaned up some of the, um, some of the residue of a murder. And so that concerns me. My question also is increasingly um, victims of homicide, the scene happens to be a car now. The, the, the people pull up uh, and they catch people off guard while they're behind the wheel. What happens when that happens to the vehicle and then the processing? Yes, sir. Um, so one, just for your first actual comment. I would agree with you. Um, public health, I think, should be part of this process. We really should be looking at crime scene cleanup well beyond just hosing things off. This is truly, you know, cleaning, disinfecting. Um, so I think that would arguably go into the realm of at least talking to public health to make sure that process happens properly. Um, moving into your question about cars. Cars, uh, much like any other scene, will be processed. Evidence will be collected from those cars. And at some point, someone can reclaim that car. Unfortunately, when they reclaim that car, that car will not have been cleaned. So it would require cleaning. It would require possibly, you know, uh, changing out parts to the car because often those cars were struck by bullet after bullet after bullet. So those would all be part of the cleanup process, which we do not have any procedures for nor the resources for. We also look at crime scene cleanup for every Philadelphia car, for every police car. When our officers respond to a scene they will often scoop and run hundreds of people in our city because we will pick up a victim and mainly because we're so close to so many great quality hospitals. We can scoop up a person, get them into the backseat of our car and quickly transport them to hopefully save a life. Every time we do that, we also have to look at uh, actually, you know, cleaning, disinfecting the back of our cars. There is a contract for that, um, which I believe, and I could be wrong on the exact number, but I believe it's about four to five hundred dollars every time we have to clean a car. Um, that process is very time consuming. The car is taken out of service. It has to be cleaned by a contractor because we don't have the people qualified to actually do it. Um, so 
So that's basically how we process cars. Hopefully yeah, that answered your question, sir. Yes, it did. In addition, can you send over the specs or qualifications you use to determine a cleaner for the city? I can talk to the people that manage the contract and I can pull that information for you. Yes, sir. Thank you so very much. Any other questions for this witness? Um, Mr. Chair, I have I have a question. Member Goodyear, recognized. Um, good morning, uh, Mr. Garvey. Good morning, council member. Um, it strikes me that this issue of crime scene cleanup and how it's dealt with fits into a broader issue of um, the support and care that we're giving to people um, in the hours right after a homicide when they're in extreme distress. Um, I wanted to know if you could describe for us what that support looks like. I, I realize that not all of this will um, fall on um, PPD, right? We could be talking about mental health. Um, we could be talking about um, violence interruption, right? Um, and, and warding off retaliatory, retaliatory shootings. But I think it's important for us to know um, if there is a, a comprehensive response um, in the hours after a shooting. And I ask this question, um, having visited the scenes of homicide uh, in my district and feeling like there wasn't a comprehensive response. While I saw police there very diligently during their work and processing the scene, um, I also saw family members and neighbors just in extreme crisis and and there, there seemed to be nothing there to deal with that. So I wanted um, for you to describe that more clearly, what, what happens now um, and how do we treat that as a city? And I also want you wanted to hear your thoughts on what it should look like. What, what should that response in the hours after um, a homicide look like if, if we're acting in a caring and compassionate way for people in our neighborhoods? Absolutely, great question, um, complicated question, but um, basically, during the processing of a scene, the primary basic job at that point is to process the scene, figure out the evidence, collect the evidence, you know, capture that, ask questions. And that is what you're seeing, that flurry, right, that you were talking about going on is focusing on that small window of time where we can preserve the evidence, capture as much information as possible to hopefully get enough evidence to close that case, to be able to solve that case, to hopefully prevent the next crime. So while that answer touches on the what we do for crime solving, which is the general job of the PPD, the next part of that question though, right, is what do we do for the people that are left at the scene? And right now that would be a comprehensive look at how's the city basically looking at what are the services for those people? Quite often those services probably come the next day or days later as the right agencies are called and people are actually reached out to. Um, I don't know of, I don't know of a program, so I don't wanna say there isn't one, but I don't know of a program right now where we would send someone out. And when I say we, I'm not just talking about the PPD, I'm talking about all of us, right? We send out anyone, public health or, or a counselor at the moment of the crime scene. That's usually after the fact. And perhaps in the same way that we talk about now when a call comes out or someone is in crisis to not only send an officer, but to send someone else, right? That can help deal with that crisis. Um, that may be something to perhaps look at some point what could be done for the victims closer to the point of trauma. But right now that typically occurs later on with, you know, saying these are the resources you can reach out to. Thank you. Um, 
I just wanted to identify that, you know, as a gap. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can come up with a better, more immediate response for people who are just you know, having the worst moment of their lives and need a, a higher level of support um, than what we're able to do um, when just focused on the crime scene cleanup. And, and I'm making that comment with the full knowledge that this uh, is a collective issue, not just the, the issue of the PPD. Yes, ma'am. Councilman Jones, if I could have permission to speak um, with respect to the councilman's question. Can, can you state your name again for the record? Yes, my name is Lisa Christian. I am the Director of Community Services at Anti-Violence Partnership of Philadelphia. Please. Um, in response to your question, Councilwoman, um, there is a program that comes out in the aftermath of homicide once um, they are informed of a homicide, and that is the Philadelphia CARES program, and that is the Crisis Assistance Response and engagement for survivors. Um, that is a program through the district attorney's office and the medical examiner's office. And the director of the program, Myra Maxwell, what she does is she dispatches what is called peer crisis responders to either the scene or um, since COVID, um, since we're under the COVID restrictions, um, that usually happens maybe a day or two and sometimes three days after a homicide has occurred. And that program, those responders go out to the homes, to the hospitals, anywhere in the community um, where that homicide has occurred to provide direct um, crisis response services to families impacted by homicide. I just wanted to make you all aware of that. Thank you. I'm aware of that program and I didn't mean to disparage the, the great work that the that DAO is doing there. They've helped um, many of my constituents. My question was more so focused on the immediate uh, sort of aftermath of a homicide and um, making sure that we're doing all we can at the scene, right, for um, the co-victims and for um, the neighbors. Um, and, and many times these neighbors are living in areas where they're barraged by shootings, right? And so um, uh, uh, um, I, I think the CARES program is great um, and I'm more so talking about right on the spot what's happening to comfort people and to treat their trauma. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Member again, uh, Member Gaudier. Um, does that conclude your questions? All right. Um, are there any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you so much for your testimony. We look forward to your follow up and please provide that to the chair and I will I'll forward that to the rest of the committee, Samantha. Who do we have next? The next panel is Antoinette Dupree, Trina Singleton, and Jeanette Barnes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Antoinette Good Dupree. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Antoinette Dupree Hart. I'm the niece of Florence Pompey and Raymond Finney. They were siblings who were murdered at 5.06 a.m. on Saturday, May 27, 2017. I was the last person who loved them to see them alive, and I was one of the people who discovered their bodies in their home on Sunday, May 28, 2017. The police department were successful in apprehending the murderer, and we, unlike many other families, have a sense of justice. My family will be forever grateful to PPD and the district attorney's office. Naturally, when we discovered my aunt and uncle, it was extremely devastating. They were the youngest son and daughter of a very large and loving family. My aunt was found with her body pressed against the wall by the window. She may have tried to escape. She was shot at close range in the head. My uncle was taken by surprise and he was shot in his head, stomach and chest in the upstairs hallway. Both scenes were gruesome and there's not a day that goes by that I don't relive this nightmare. The police went about their business of processing the crime scene. They did their job. 
When they were done, the police informed us that we were okay to go into the house. I'm the oldest niece and I was designated uh, as the person responsible for making all funeral arrangements. I was forewarned that the police only took care of the necessary, what was necessary to collect evidence and process the scene and that there was no cleanup. My uncle Reggie, um, the victim's brother, volunteered to go in and clean up so that I could look for the insurance documents and clothes for my aunt and uncle's final arrangements. I drove him there and waited in a car. He spent close to two hours cleaning and afterwards told me it was okay to go into the house. He said he'd wait in the car for me until I was done. So I went in and uh, did the job of picking out clothes and looking for the documents. My uncle did an amazing job. He took the time and the care needed to protect me from seeing what he actually saw. When I came back out, my uncle was gone. We didn't see him again until the day of my aunt's funeral five days later. Um, a note about my uncle who undertook the task of cleaning up behind his brother and sister's murder. We're, they were a family of nine siblings. My uncle Raymond was the youngest boy and my aunt Tina Florence was the youngest girl. But my uncle Reggie was between the two. So he had just lost his bookends. Also, um, uncle Reggie was, is a recovering drug addict. He was clean for four years before this happened. He's quiet and kind and a gentle soul. But he was clean before he had gone in that house. Since the day that he had to clean his sister's blood and brain matter off the walls and scrub his baby brother's blood out of the carpet, my uncle has not been able to stay sober. He has been to rehab, but it just does not stick. Our family has suffered a loss, all of us. The crime was devastating because of the nature of it. And also the perpetrator was my Uncle Raymond's son. But Uncle Reggie has suffered the most. He once said that he couldn't get over going in that house and scraping parts of his sister off the walls and scrubbing his brother away. His eyes have seen things that his mind just can't unsee. Murder scene cleanup is something that no family should have to contemplate at a time when their life is basically shattered. In our family's case, we didn't know what to expect and we needed to get into that house quickly because my uncle's religion required that he be buried in a tight timeline. We were shell-shocked and we did not know what to ask. Um, we had to cover funeral expenses because my uncle was uninsured. So we did that and that was fine. Um, but the expense of a cleanup would have been taxing and stressful. Not to mention the idea, as someone mentioned before, of Googling crime scene companies crime scene cleanup companies still shakes me to my core. Um, it's really important that this resolution be passed. No family should be prepared. No family is emotionally prepared to clean up um, a murder scene, not one. All families are not in the financial position to cover up, uh, cover the upfront cost of a crime scene cleanup. While the $500 grant to reimburse the cleanup is great, is not practical for all families um, who may be struggling to cover the expense of an unplanned funeral, or as in my family's case, two funerals. The traumatizing effect, not right now, okay. The traumatizing effect uh, of doing this is, long, is long-term. It's been four years and my uncle is still struggling. I apologize. Uh, I thank you for your time and consideration. I, first, thank you for sharing that testimony, and we we still apologize for your loss. Um, but it was very important for us to hear not the statistics, not just the cost factors, but the cost in human emotional capital that goes along with this. Um, and so this is very important. Um, for, for people, unfortunately, that will have to go through what you went through and what your family had to go through. Uh, and um, we salute your courage for stepping up as a, 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 a pillar in your family to deal with those hard decisions that come after, after, the, after those kinds of losses. 
So um, thank you. Thank you so very much. Are there any questions? Okay. Hearing none, um, thank you for your testimony. Trina Singleton. Ms. Singleton? Yes, I'm here. One moment, please. No problem. Thank you for your patience. Give one second. Take your time. Good morning. Thank Good morning. Patient. Okay. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to participate today. My name is Trina Singleton and my son is Daryl Singleton. He was murdered on September 13th, 2016. Um, the process for us was very um, confusing because he was murdered in the back of our um, home, like in a driveway area. So the police did not tape off any part of the crime scene and they did not tell us whether we should clean it or we shouldn't clean it or should we touch it or sh we didn't we didn't know what we were supposed to do with that scene and so somebody in our family hosed it down so the same night that it happened i'm guessing before the police even were able to get anything from the scene, somebody had hosed it down. And so then we wind up going there the next day and my husband was able to find bullets and things and, you know, just stuff. But we had, we had compromised the scene because we washed it and nobody told us what to do. So, um, we, we didn't know where to go, you know, and we didn't know who to talk to. Um, we never got any information about how we handled it or how it should have been handled. Um, the information that we wound up finally getting to help us was from the coroner's office. We sent a family member to identify the body and they came back with a white envelope. And then I opened it. And so that's how I even found out about counseling for the family um, thing. So if I wasn't in a state of mind to like look at that information, <clears throat> we would have just been, you know, just floundering around trying to figure out what to do. Me and my husband, you know, we just, we were lost. So um, thank, I'm going to say thankfully there was that envelope full of information but I know from my experience with other parents who are in a similar situation everybody doesn't open that everybody doesn't read um, those that information so a lot of time we are left in a trauma situation with with no nowhere to go with with no one you know to do and again I think it's just really a cold situation where I'm just holding down, you know, body matter from my deceased child. And, and that's that, you know, that's that no wrap up, no encapsulation, no process or plan to help. So um, I'm glad that you guys are having this meeting. I think that it will, help humanize um the fact that we are losing our children it's just so inhumane the, the the way that the homicide is handled once it does happen so i i thank you very much for hearing me and um you know i hope that this helps some other families in the future 
have a different experience. Thank well, you. Thank you for your courage. Um, and we, we apologize and for your loss and nobody should on their worst day have to deal with those kinds of issues. And, and, and what disturbs me from your testimony is that you didn't know what the crime scene and how it should be treated and then how it should be cleaned. And we have to get better as a city. I'm not pointing fingers at the departments, but pointing to solutions to be able to get that envelope, not only of services that can be provided, but here's the responsibility of a crime scene. What are our responsibilities? What are your responsibilities? And clearly, who's responsible for what portion of it? So um, thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions for this witness? Hearing none, Samantha, can you call the next person to testify? Is Jeanette Barnes um, present? Uh, okay, Councilman, I think we can move on to the next panel. Um, so I will call up uh, Renee Norris Jones and Brett Roman Williams and Esther Mander, who may need to be called in. Thank you. Are my witnesses there? Please take your device off mute. Let me know you're there. Uh, Brett Williams is here, Councilman Jones. How are you? I'm thank well, thank you. Thank you for your patience. State your name for the record, and please begin your testimony. Uh, Hello? Hi, are you speaking? Oh, I'm sorry. I want to I make sure I follow the order, Councilman Jones. So. Okay. I was, sec I was second on the list. Okay, so who should go first, Sam? Renee, if she's um, able to unmute. Yes, Renee's her. here. Okay. Yes. State your name for the record. Thank you for your patience. And please begin your testimony. Yes, this my is name is Renee Norris. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm hearing other voices in here. Uh, this is Renee Norris Jones. Um, my sister, Patricia Norris, was murdered in 1999. Uh, it was a domestic violence incident. It was a murder-suicide. Um, Oh. We found out about it, and uh, the family came together. Um, I'm a survivor of domestic violence, so I'm trying to piece together the pieces in my head. Um, but I know, so we, we knew about it, and we found out about that it happened. It was on the news, and the family came together to plan the funeral. I knew that there was a viewing at the morgue, and it was a video at the morgue. Um, it was just a video. It was just like a picture of her face. And we, we did that and then we went back to my father's house at the time and we were trying to determine if she had life insurance, where was her purse, where were her belongings, kind of what was going on. She was actually at the house and she was staying in a domestic violence shelter and she met at my father's insistence, my father and the, her husband at the house and within five minutes he shot her point blank and then shot himself. So we knew this much had happened. And so while we're at my dad's house, we didn't didn't have a purse or anything. And so my sister and I decided we were going to go up to the house and look and see whether her purse was here. The house was a rental, so it was completely empty um, because the previous tenants had moved out. So we went in the house. We didn't see anything in the living room, dining room. And my sister said, I'll go upstairs. And I said, I'll go down to the basement. And I remember getting down to the basement as I entered the basement floor and turned to go into the basement, I just remember just gasping and I must have gasped loud enough for my sister on the second floor to hear me and come running. And I was saying to her, don't come, don't come, don't come because she was shot point blank in the head up against the, the wall. So I witnessed brain matter, body matter, floor, everything. And my sister, because typically if you tell someone don't come after you scream, they're gonna come anyway. And she had the same reaction. As someone who is a survivor of domestic violence, 
um, probably for the same amount of period that my sister was. Um, my ex-husband, so this was especially traumatizing to me because my ex-husband was arrested in 1984 for bludgeoning his mother to death with an axe. So I already had trauma with me. Um, needless to say, this was traumatizing to myself. My sister, who is um, who was a survivor, um, I'm an ad currently an advocate for domestic violence. I am a woman against abuse. Got me to safety in 1979. They got me 1,600 miles away for safety. So this brought back all of that. I currently sit on the board of directors at Women Against Abuse to help other women, but I have to limit my testimony because. It triggers me, but this was important enough for me to speak out, um, know that I have therapy within, you know, tomorrow to help me through this. But it was important enough for me to speak out and risk um, being re-triggered. Uh, but I did not know, as I'm listening to the testimony, I did not know that there were people who came and cleaned that up. Our reaction was, my God, I've never been at a crime scene before. I would think that they cleaned this up. This is what, um, this is the thought in my head. I did not know. Meanwhile, you're trying to look away. I did not know what to do at that point. I don't even remember leaving the house. I remember my sister and I standing there crying. I don't remember going upstairs. I don't remember leaving, but I remember at that point, we just stood there for a really long time crying. Um, but I was confused. It's kind of the hours and the days went on going. How come someone didn't clean this up? I did not know that they didn't clean up crime scenes and people are walking into this. So I'm, I'm hearing other people testif testify and I'm going, totally agree. I, 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 how can you let someone walk into this or at least not let them let them know that this is what they're going to walk into? Maybe I watch too many police things on TV where you don't see that, but it was to this day traumatizing. Um, That's it. I mean, at least that someone has a question. I, I, that's pretty much what I have right now that, that I can share. Thank you for putting this on the record. And um, thank you for your strength to be able to, to recount uh, what happened. And hopefully that this sacrifice you're making today will help other people avoid that trauma. And so I think. Absolutely. And uh, we appreciate what you do for the organization and for others. Uh, and in so, hopefully you will find the peace you need. Thank you. And I, I just want to say thank you guys for bringing this, to making this happen. Because it's, it's here that the change happens. So it's an honor to be here. And thank you guys for doing this. Council Member Jones. Yes, Member Gim. Yes, thank you. Um, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Norris Jones um, and all the testifiers uh, for having the courage um, to share what you shared today. And, uh, you know, Dr. Norris Jones, um, for the work that you do, the continued work that you do to come out of pain and trauma and terror, honestly, uh, to bring other women to safety, um, just cannot be underscored. And so, you know, you have our incredible gratitude and that is to all the testifiers who are on here today. Um, it's not lost on us that many of us you know, many of the testifiers are also women. Um, and, you know, we're just, we're very thoughtful and grateful and attentive to this issue. Thank you. Thank you, members. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Samantha, who's next? My name is Esther Mander. Ms. Mander, thank you. Steve. Yes. Uh, please begin your testimony. My sister was the one who had uh, succumbed to domestic violence as well and was her own nephew, my nephew, uh, who did it. But what I wanted the council to keep in mind was that the blood is our life force. We're already grieving. We miss the words that were spoken by our loved ones. We wish their presence, their smile, their encouragement, the meaning behind each of those words, 
the things we did together, what, whether it was planning a meal, preparing a meal, having a picnic or whatever, it's, it's all gone. So we're already grieving. And we walk, like the young lady just said, we walk into the house to plan the funeral and there's blood all over. Um, from the kitchen through the hall, up the steps and down the hall towards the bedroom where she actually collapsed. But my son and I were the ones who got in and had to clean up the blood. Um, it's, it's very, very hard to do so. You're already crying. You're already upset, grieving, mad, and still not to understand why. So there's a million things that go through your mind. And as you change the water to get the rest of the blood up, or some cases the door out of the brains are all over, no one should have to go through that. And if it's possible to start this task force for the cleanup so the families and the individuals do not have to live through that, that would be absolutely wonderful. It's hard enough like you said, to make the plans and figure out insurances and funeral homes and ministers and all that kind of stuff and have to clean uh, the blood up as well. It's, it's very, very hard, very tearing. So like the young lady was saying, this is where we start at ground roots level, grassroots level, I'm sorry, ground floor, and make sure that each one understands that's a very hard thing to do. It has to be done before everyone else starts coming in with their ideas and, and their ministers and prayers and everything. That has to be cleaned up before there can be any kind of a meeting. And it's, it's a little much to ask the family members to do so immediately. So I, too, appreciate the opportunity given me to let you know it does hit hard. We're not all cold. Now, I've been nursed, and I've seen lots of people die over 42 years of nursing. Some were GI bleeders, but still, it's not the same type of thing. It's someone that you're close to or closer to than a patient. If we could possibly get that going, I would certainly be the one to say, yes, yes, I'm all for it. So thank you again for allowing me these few minutes to speak to you. Thank, thank you for your testimony and adding your voice to um, the chorus of voices who've had to go through this. Um, and um, it, it does matter. Uh, it, it adds to why uh, we need to do something um, to, to spare people this pain. Thank you so much for your testimony. Samantha? You're welcome. Brett Woman Williams? Mr. Williams? Maybe your microphone's on mute, Mr. Williams. Who's next, Samantha? He was our last witness. Um, he had his camera on um, prior to the last witness's testimony. It I looks like he may have. I thought I saw him. Well, if, if that's the last witness, um, are there any others to testify on this resolution? It looks I'm, like Mr. Williams is signed back in. Um, Mr. Williams, are you there? I just, uh, How are you? I'm can, well, thank you. Can you state your name for the record and begin your testimony? Yes, my name is Brett Roman Williams. I am the uh, chairman of the board of directors for the Anti-Violence Partnership of Philadelphia. I'm also a Philadelphia native and also a co-victim of homicide. Um, my brother 
Well, let me start off. Uh, my first cousin was murdered when I was five years old, 1989. Best friend was murdered. And my father was murdered when I was 11. And in 2016, my uh, older brother was murdered. Um, this is definitely an honor and unfortunate privilege, I should say, to be here to speak before you, Council Member Jones and all the other city council members. I would like to thank my colleagues at AVP for leading this discussion. And also, um, just bear with me, I have my mask on because I'm in a public location. But okay. I'll read my notes real quick in terms of just preparing for this hard statement. Um, again, my name is Brett Roman Williams. I am the chairman of the Board of Directors for the Anti-Violence Partnership of Philadelphia. While growing up in Philadelphia, after experiencing the trauma of gun violence since the age of five, unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm here today as a result of my older brother, Derek Williams, who was murdered five years ago on October 22nd, 2016. As the news reported on that night, my brother was a 52-year-old man murdered execution style while coming home from a 76ers game home opener. To be honest, the news article should have said he was killed two doors away from his home. I was with him at that game until we departed and went our separate ways. I remember receiving calls around midnight. Now, I wasn't at a family's house at the time. However, I rushed over and my life changed forever. I saw the cars lined up on our street in West Oak Lane. I saw the yellow tape. I saw the police, the news reporters. I saw the Dunkin' Donuts cup that my brother was carrying when he was murdered. And it was left on the scene of the crime. I saw my brother's blood on the street. I took pictures. I have the memories. I saw articles of my brother's clothing on the crime scene. He was wearing a down vest with feathers. So I vividly remember seeing the white feathers from the vest floating in the blood the following morning. I even picked up some of the remains, such as buttons, drawstrings, because I knew it belonged to my brother to hand over to the homicide detectives the following day when they came. My family was also given my brother's clothes in the paper bag once they were through with the invest investigation and evidence. I was insulted and disgusted by the sheer negligence of the PPD. Right. It's all right. So it's trauma. This case remains unsolved. It's been five years. Now, keep in mind, we have two residences on the street where my brother was murdered. One is literally across the street from the scene of the crime. The other is literally two doors down where our mother lives. Every day we go outside, we see that crime scene. Now, I know the specifics and particulars of crime scene cleanup within the victim's compensation funding has a certain level of eligibility, which doesn't really pertain to crime scenes outside. But as mentioned in this hearing, many cases on the street, many ke many cases are on the street and are not in the homes. And that's why I will never forget seeing my neighbors spraying and scrubbing my blood brother, like my brother's blood off the street. No one from the city, the city called or attempted to clean the scene. My neighbor had to experience this. So on top of the trauma that my family had to experience, it makes it difficult for me to properly communicate with my neighbors due to my recollection of him cleaning my brother's blood. In the subconscious of my mind, I feel obligated to his peace. Now, I'd like to be clear about how I found out about the victim's compensation fund, because many Philadelphia residents aren't aware of the victim's compensation fund or the services that are available to co-victims in terms of receiving reimbursements that are eligible. Had I not been the closest of my brother's kin to identify him at the medical examiner's office, I would have not been privy to any of this information. I consider myself lucky to be in this position and to have the capacity to, tef to testify today. Since I've been made aware and have been entrenched in this work as being an advocate of co-victim's rights, I frequently ask my fellow Philadelphia residents, do they know of any of this information? In most cases, many say no. This must change. With the level of violence and crime scenes steadily increasing in Philadelphia, this should be highly publicized, distributed, and made very visible. There needs to be a comprehensive and trauma-informed system and process that is easy, easily accessible and should be a standard. We need a solution to this issue. The people of Philadelphia should not be obligated to seek this information. The burden should not be on the people of Philadelphia to clean up the remains of any crime scene. 
The people of Philadelphia should not have blood on our hands. Thank you, Councilman Jones. Thank you, City Council. And thank you to my esteemed colleagues of the Anti-Violence Partnership of Philadelphia for leading this initiative. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, thank you for uh, being a part of the uh, network that I've got to meet and meet with to learn your valuable services you provide to the city of Philadelphia. Um, Maria Holloway, name nobody's going to pretty much know about. Um, her, her name was Twin. Um, and when I was 16 years old, we were on our way to a party. Uh, we shared an umbrella. She was shot in the back of the head and killed. I was 16. Um, I'm gonna talk about it a lot, um, but that was done on Upland Way, uh, right around 56. Uh, and I remember because it was raining um, and when she fell to the ground, the crime scene washed away by the rain. Um, there's not a day I pass that corner that I don't look to that scene and it serves um, as a constant echo, a constant reminder, a constant pebble in a pond uh, that we all as co-victims go through. Um, so um, the burden of cleaning that scene shouldn't be left on the victims, again, on their worst day. Um, things that we will take away from this hearing are that we need to get further data from the Pennsylvania Crime and Delinquency Committee about um, uh, Member Gim's inquiry as to why people are rejected. It is as important as why people receive the funds so that we can close the gaps, help to um, smooth out some of the regulations uh, to do so. Also, that we will work with our state partners, lawmakers, to take a look at the statute to see if it's time to increase the amount of reimbursement from $500 to more uh, reasonable reimbursement of somewhere in the neighborhood of $2,500 where the average crime scene cleanup costs. Another takeaway uh, was uh, that, that I'll never forget is that there are 48 zip codes in the city of Philadelphia. Eight of them produced the majority of homicides in the city of Philadelphia. And maybe, just maybe there should be a, um, I'm not, I'm not going to call it a battlefield fund, but a fund that uh, addresses some of the high concentration of homicides in that area and provides special assistance for those zip codes, of which two of them are in the fourth council Matic district. Um, these takeaways and more will be produced a white paper that will report from this committee and any members that want to give input to it, uh, a draft of it will be sent to the members of this committee and then finalized and pre presented to the full body of council before the mayor does his budget address so that we can spare people from ever having to be victimized not once, not twice, but three times by cleaning up at a crime scene. Um, are there any other members that wish to give closing comments? Seeing none, this concludes the business of the Committee on Public Safety to deal with today's resolution. Thank you all for testifying and thank all council members for participating. Thank you.